In this video, we will evaluate the final and arguably most complex form of market structure, that is the oligopoly. And really what we mean by oligopoly, we're kind of, if we recall, going back to that right-hand side of our continuum of market structure. If we recall how that went on the far left, we had perfect competition. Then we had monopolistic competition. As we began to move to the right, we had our oligopolies. And then on the far right, we had our monopolies. So we've taken a look at all three of our market structures so far. Oligopoly is the last one remaining. Essentially what's happening with an oligopoly is we have just a few large firms. So in this case, we don't have that monopoly. We don't just have that one large firm that gets to do whatever they want, that one large firm being the market. We have oligopolies. We have two or few large firms, and these two or few large firms control the market. In this case, when we move through this, uh, when we move through this video, we're going to presume a very simplistic case of an oligopoly. This simplistic case is known as a duopoly, duo as in two, and that is where a monopoly, mono one, where a monopoly is looking at one large firm. Our special case of oligopoly, a duopoly, would be looking at two large firms. Okay, so up until this point, we have had either one firm controlling the market, that's our monopoly, or we've had so many small firms, right, lots of small firms, that any one firm's actions had no real consequence on the market or on the other firms. In this case here, in the case of a duopoly, that's no longer the case. We now have a situation where the actions of one player end up influencing what the other one should do. If one firm decides to start selling this good, well, that's going to eat into the market demand of what the other firm is selling. So these firms are actively competing against each other. They are very much engaging in this competitive behavior, trying to outdo each other, perform, create better goods, offer better services, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in order to get your demand, in order to get your money, essentially. So what we end up seeing in this is that these firms end up needing to figure out how to act strategically. That is, firm A needs to decide how much do I produce given that I have to split the market with firm B. And because I have to split the market with firm B, well, okay, how much am I going to produce given what firm B is going to produce? And then firm B does the same thing. They go, okay, how much am I going to produce given what firm A is going to produce? On and on and on and on. And thus the nature of our problem. So to kind of give it an example, to give it some context to kind of get started off, what we can look at is we can look at some oligopolies here in Canada. Our famous oligopolies here in Canada are, of course, our telecom sector. Telecommunications, our telecom sector. And we have actually quite a few players, but to keep with our duopoly kind of theme, let's limit it down to say, hey, we have Shaw. And we have TELUS. Now, yes, truthfully, we also have Bell. We also have Rogers. And some of you might say, well, don't we also have like Fido and Kudo and all of those other guys? No, we actually don't. They're all part. They're subsidiaries of Rogers, subsidiaries of TELUS, etc., etc. So we really only have about four players in the telecom market. But simplistically speaking, we're just going to be taking a look at our duopoly. Let's write that down. Duopoly. And our duopolists, in this case, are Shaw and Telus. Now, both Shaw and Telus are trying to get the market. They're both trying to, well, hey, fundamental assumption of firm behavior, right? The reason why these exist is both of these firms exist to maximize their profit, right? And again, just like any other firm, our profit equation is written as our total revenue minus our total cost. Total revenue minus total cost, we can expand that to say, hey, profit is price times quantity minus our total fixed cost plus our total variable cost. Again, quantity, well, Quantity is ultimately everything we end up choosing in this case here. That is, again, our duopolists, just like in our other cases, choose an optimal level of Q. We'll call that Q star. 
such that at this quantity produced, at this quantity bought and sold, they are profit maximizing. And again, if we want to talk about why it all comes down to a choice of quantity over anything else, let's, let's take a look. So first of all, why do we compete over quantity and not price? Well, the reason we compete over quantity and not price is as such, let's take a look here. If we are going and assessing our demand for our good, there's our market demand. What we witness in this case is that by choosing a quantity, I obtain a price. If I decide to produce less, I obtain a higher price. So that is by choosing an optimal quantity Q star, I am also then choosing the corresponding price attached to that. So again, all comes down to my choice of output. Similarly, well, what about our cost structure? What's going on here? Well, let's keep in mind that Q star, our quantity, our quantity is just some function given our technology of labor and capital. Keep in mind, in the short run, our capital is fixed, so we don't get to choose our level of capital. Hey, fixed capital, fixed costs. So my capital cost is my fixed cost. Well, what about my labor cost? Well, if I want to change my output, the only thing I can influence in this equation is my labor, such that if I increase my labor, I increase my output. Of course, vice versa, if I decrease my labor, I would also decrease my output. And in this sense here as well, hey, as I choose labor, I ultimately will end up influencing my total variable cost, right? My labor cost, essentially, in this case here. So thus, by, choice, by choosing my level of output, Q, I choose how much work I need, and thus I choose my cost structure as well. So again, in our duopolists, everything comes down to this optimal choice of output. How much am I going to produce? Okay, so we have both Shaw and Telus in this case. Let's go back to our example now that we've kind of said, hey, we have this, we have our firms, we're maximizing profit, we're choosing our Q. Oh, we missed this, right? We jumped over this. We choose our Q such that, this is the big thing, always every market structure, Marginal revenue equals marginal cost. That's our optimal. That's our profit maximizing level of output. This is where we would choose our Q star. Okay. So both Shaw and Telus, they are competing. Let's say they're competing in specifically our market for home internet. So they're competing for the market for home internet. They have the choice, right? They have the choice. They can either provide this service through cable or through fiber. Now the problem is, right, cable, you can get pretty fast speeds through it, but it becomes congested and at peak times, well, your speeds, how much bandwidth you have available to you slows down. Fiber, this is fiber optic, this essentially uses light to transmit, it's a lot more expensive to put in, but you don't get this congestion. So if you're using fiber, you don't get that congestion, you don't get that slowdown during peak times, and thus you have reliably faster, consistent internet access. Okay, both Shaw and Telus are trying to figure out what do we do? Do we invest in cable or do we invest in fiber? Right, and to start off, let's presume, let's presume that we have this case, let's just scroll things down a little bit. Let's presume that they already have cable. Right, so they already have the cable infrastructure in place. Our question then is, do we invest in fiber? Do we invest in fiber? Do we want to go and spend the millions of dollars to lay fiber networks, or are we happy with just cable? Well, ultimately this all comes back down to, well, what's the other guy gonna do, right? If TELUS, if TELUS has said, yes, I'm going to do cable, well, then Shaw has two options. Shaw could either also do cable. That is, these two could essentially decide to not compete with each other. Just, hey, look, I'm not going to incur any extra cost. If you don't lay fiber, you don't incur any extra costs. People don't get fiber, but we get to split pretty handsome profits between us without taking these costs. Alternatively, what Shaw could do 
Shaw could go and start laying fiber. If Shaw goes and starts to lay fiber, well, by laying fiber, they're going to face extra costs in order to lay all this, which is going to eat into their profit. But by laying fiber, what they end up doing is they end up getting to steal a whole bunch of Telus's clients by saying, hey, we have faster, better internet and all this. And so although their costs get to increase, so does their quantity, right? So ultimately they're choosing their quantity, which is affecting their cost in that case again. So in that case, what Shaw can do is they can jump to fiber by jumping and laying fiber. They can increase their quantity drastically, thus increasing their profitability. Stealing clients from TELUS, making TELUS upset. Well, of course, TELUS has the same kind of situation. TELUS can look at this and they can say, okay, sure, we're going to think that Shaw stays with the status quo. They stay with cable. Well, TELUS could either stay with the status quo as well, not incur any extra cost, or they could jump over to fiber. And as they jump over to fiber, they could very similarly, right, they'd incur all the extra cost to increase their quantity, but they get to effectively steal customers from Shaw and thus increase their profitability. The question is, what should you do? If you were an executive with Shaw or if you were an executive with TELUS, what do you want to do? Do you just stay with cable or do you switch to fiber? If TELUS stays with cable, well, you might be better off to stay with cable as well. You don't incur the cost and you guys need just to split the existing profit. If you're worried that TELUS might jump to fiber, it might be worthwhile to beat them to it and jump to fiber first. If you're sure that TELUS is going to jump to fiber, maybe you should just directly jump to fiber. Or hey, if TELUS jumps to fiber, maybe they've already captured that. Maybe it's just best to keep your costs low and monopolize the cable market, right? So there's a lot to think about what's going on here. But the big takeaway is that whatever TELUS decides to do will impact Shaw's decision. And vice versa, whatever Shaw decides to do will impact TELUS's outcome as well. That is, in these games of strategy, I have to choose my best response to your action. Keeping in mind that you're also a rational individual and you will also be choosing your best response to my action. So what we need to do, we need to figure out what each of our best responses are once we identify each individual's best responses, we can then look for overlap between these best responses. And as we find overlap between these best responses, we can obtain an equilibrium. And in this case, with game theory, the overlap will go the overlap of best responses. The overlap of best responses, these are known as Nash equilibrium. And maybe I should say Nash equilibria because in a given game that we play, there may be zero, one, or many Nash equilibria, right? There doesn't necessarily have to be one and there doesn't necessarily have to be a unique one either. We can at times have many going on. So, Let's take a look at how exactly we approach this. Let's take a look at how we can figure out best responses and then based off these best responses, what ought to be done by each firm. And in order to do so, let's go back and let's take a look at one of the classic games used to often introduce this concept. And this classic game is known as the Prisoner's Dilemma. The Prisoner's Dilemma. So the Prisoner's Dilemma goes as such. There are two guys who have gone and robbed a bank. Now, they've gotten away. There's no real evidence pinning them to this, or at least no evidence that's hard enough to really prove for sure, right? Given our criminal law, prove without a shadow of a doubt that these guys, that these guys actually committed the crime. However, the police have still picked up these two criminals on other warrants, right? So there's other outstanding warrants for their arrest, and so the police could still be, based off of that, still arrest them and still put them away, charge them in jail for these other crimes. That being said, the police are very sure that it was these two who did it. So 
what the police do is they pick these two thieves up, they separate them right off the start, they throw them in different interrogation rooms, and they give them the following options. They say, they say, if you snitch, that is, if you give up your partner, if you say, yes, the partner did it, we were involved in that bank robbery, they stole the money, right? If they give up their partner, they get to go free. They get amnesty, they get immunity from this crime, and they get to go free. That is, they get zero years of jail. However, their partner, the one that they've ratted out, their partner is going to get 10 years in jail. So I'm going to say negative 10, that's 10 years in jail. That's, that's a bad payout, right? You don't want that. So we're going to say negative 10 years in jail. The alternative, the alternative is that they stay silent. If they stay silent, well, like I said, there's existing warrants for their arrest. The police want each of them for these outstanding charges. So, hey, they both stay silent. They don't rat out each other. Well, they get charged with existing crimes. So charged with existing. And they both, uh, they both end up getting five years in prison, right? So not as serious of crimes. It's only five years in prison compared to the bank robbery, which would potentially lead to 10. So we have our situation if they stay silent. Finally, we have a situation where maybe they snitch on each other, right? This was a case where one guy snitched and the other guy stayed silent. But what if they both snitch? What if they both say, yeah, yeah, no, no, we did it. The partner, he robbed the bank. He made me do it. I was just, I was dragged along. Well, if they both snitch, if they both snitch because no one's getting really the hard sentence on this case here, they'll both get eight years. So let's go like this. They're going to both go away for eight years. The question is, the question is, what should you do? Right? If you're one of these prisoners, you cannot talk to your partner, right? You cannot talk to your partner. You're stuck in this room. What is your best response? Keeping in mind that really your outcome depends on what your partner does as well. So let's take a look at how we would represent this in a in a in a game, uh, what we'd call our game matrix. So let's build our game matrix. For each player. We are going to have a row player and we're going to have a column player. And the way this will end up working is something like such. We'll go, our first option is to be, oh, let's use the right tool here. Our first option is that we could be silent. Our second option, of course, is that we could snitch. And we'll say that this here is for player A. We'll change colors. We'll say that player B similarly has the option to be silent or to snitch and that this here is player B. So okay, in this case here, player B is our row player, player A is our column player. What we want to do is we want to fill out this payoff matrix, this game matrix, as to what each individual player's payoff, what their reward is going to be based on each box. So to start off, let's start off in the top left here. That is this intersection of silent, silent. That is if they both stay silent. Well, what happens in this case? If they both stay silent, they're charged with existing and they both get five years in jail. So, okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go negative five and negative five. And the way that we wanna read this, right, and I've color coded on purpose just to make it a bit easier, the first payoff represents the row player. The second payoff represents the column player. So that is, if we end up at this box, this outcome of silent, silent, well, prisoner B gets five years in prison. Prisoner A gets five years in prison. So we have our outcome. Let's jump to the opposite outcome, an outcome where we both snitch on each other. Well, if we both snitch on each other, well, again, we both get eight years. 
So we would have negative 8 for player B and negative 8 for player A. We then have these kind of situations where one stays silent, the other one snitches. So what happens in this case? Well, if I get to snitch on my partner, my partner gets 10 years and I get to go free. That is if they don't snitch on me as well, right? If we both snitch, well, we both went away. So what I have is I have this 0, 10 kind of payoff. So let's take a look. If player B snitches, but player A stays silent, well, player B, player B gets 0 years in jail, and player A gets 10 years. Ooh, that's, that's not so good, right? Similarly, what we would get is our other extreme. And in our other extreme here, player B stays silent while A snitches. So A is snitched, meaning B goes away for 10 years. And our other player gets zero in prison. So now what we have, we have our, we have our game matrix. We have our situation here. We want to work out what is the Nash equilibrium. That is, what do we do? What is our best response in order to maximize my reward, in order to maximize my payoff? Or in this case, right, keep in mind, because everything is negative, in order to maximize my payoff, I am alternatively minimizing my loss. So let's take a look at two things. Let's take a look at first how to maximize my reward or my payoff, keeping in mind, this is our fundamental assumption as we've gone through this whole course. Individuals are utility maximizing. Firms are profit maximizing, right? So in this case here, if we think about just utility or profit as our payoff, well, yeah, maximizing individuals, that's, that's how we've kind of explained human behavior. But let's keep in mind our other thing we've also looked at. We've also taken a look at kind of these social these social optimals, such that social surplus, kind of the social welfare, was maximized. And what we witnessed through a lot of this course, mind you, we took a look at our market failures where this wasn't true, but what we took a look at through most of this course is that typically individuals maximizing their own payoffs, so maximizing their own profits, maximizing their own utility, Individual maximization typically led to social maximization, right? The two were relatable. The two worked out. It wasn't an end or zero sum game. We could have individual maximization and social maximization occurring. We saw this with perfect competition. We saw this with a lot of markets, with our private goods, etc. Fell apart when we had market power, of course. Well, let's take a look at what's happening here. And to start off, let's start by taking a look at this social optimal. Keeping in mind, in this case here, our society is prisoner A and B. We want to take a look at the situation such that our outcome, our total payoff in some box, is the social optimal. And so the way we can do that is we can take a look at this and say, okay, hey, in this case here, negative 5, negative 5, that's 10 years in prison. 0, negative 10, oh, that's 10 years in prison, 10 years in prison, 16 years in prison, right? So between these two, these three all share this 10 years in prison situation, but between them, well, technically we'd be indifferent between them all as a society, they all give us the exact same level, but this guy, silent, silent, would likely be our optimal altogether because it'd be shared equally, it'd be kind of our fair social optimal. But keep in mind, in reality, given this, they all have a social payoff of negative 10. We would have all three of these guys occurring as, now eh, we're indifferent between them from a social viewpoint. They're all giving us the same social payoff. So, okay, let's keep that in mind. Let's now work out the game. Let's work out what each individual is doing. Let's work out how they are maximizing their own individual response. And the way we want to play this is we want to start off by picking a player. And I'm going to start off by picking the row player, so player B. And essentially what you want to do is you want to figure out what is my best thing to do if the other player does something for sure, right? So essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, I know, I know that player A is going to be silent. 
If player A is silent, what is my best payoff? So player B goes, okay, I know A is silent. I'm choosing between negative 5 and 0. What do I prefer in this case? Well, I would prefer 0. So, okay, I kind of highlight what my response is, my best response to A being silent. I then go and I switch player A's strategy. I now switch and I say, okay, player A is going to snitch. If player A is going to snitch, what is my best response to that? Well, so we go and take a look at that. If we know for sure player A is going to snitch, I have either payoffs of negative 10 or negative 8. What's, what's my kind of preference in this case? Right? They're both lousy. Which one's minimizing my loss? Well, in this case here, between the two, negative 8 is a much better loss, right? If I was between losing $10 or losing $8, I'd prefer to only lose 8. So I'm going to choose this payoff here. And what we see is that player B has an optimal strategy. That is irrespective of what player A does, if player A is silent or if player B, or sorry, if player A is silent or if player A snitches, player B always is best off to snitch. That's always in their interest. They're always better off by snitching versus staying silent. Okay, so we've now figured out what player B's optimal kind of strategy is, and we now want to switch it. We now want to switch players. So now we're player A. As player A is the column player, we're focusing on the second set of payoffs. And what we want to do is we want to now do the same thing. We want to say, okay, as player A, what is my best response if player B stays silent? If player B for sure is silent, what should I do? So in this case, we're looking at a payoff of either negative 5 or 0. Well, again, zero sounds like the better out of those two. So we take that guy. We then update. We go down and we say, hey, what if player B for sure snitches? Well, if player B for sure snitches, we have the possibility of either getting negative 10, 10 years in prison, or 8 years in prison. Uh, again, I'd rather the lower years in prison. So negative 8 is my outcome here. We see that again, in this case here, player A has a dominant strategy, and that dominant strategy is, again, always to snitch. They're always better off by snitching. We see, in fact, that neither player has in their best interest to be silent, even though, even though the social optimal was including a silent outcome. Our private optimal, each individual actually acting in their own best interest, gives us our Nash equilibrium at negative 8, negative 8. That is, by each individual acting in their own best interest, we get an overlap of best responses at a snitch, snitch outcome. And so as a result, we end up at snitch, snitch, and with the lowest possible social welfare, right? The worst possible social outcome in this case here. So the way that this ends up working through in our scenario. Okay, so that's the idea of game theory, right? We could change this up, our payoffs, we could change up what our categories are. We always play the game the same. We pick a player to start with, and then based off of that player, we say, okay, if I know what you're going to do, what is my best response to that? And then we pick our best response. Then I change. Okay, what if you do this instead? What's my best response to that? Okay, I switch again. Switch again, right? And we go through all of the other players' options, and I work out my best response to all of their options. We get all of our best responses. We then switch players, and we repeat this. We get all the other players' best responses. We then go and we look for overlapping best responses. As we go look for over, overlapping best responses, these overlapping best responses, these guys here, these are what we refer to as our Nash equilibria. And in this case here, I just have one, so this would be my Nash equilibrium. This is my stable level. 
This is where I'm going to end up. This is the only point in this entire game that is stable where one player does not have an incentive to deviate. And, and let's talk about that. You're like, what? Player doesn't have an incentive to deviate? Well, what if they came into this game saying, no, 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 no. Guys, we've talked about it ahead, ahead of time. We're going to promise to stay quiet. That is, they have both come into this agreeing to stay at silent, silent. Right? They're like, hey, look, this is this is socially best for us. We both do our time. It's only five years. We'll get out. Just don't rat out each other. Well, cool. Great scenario. But what ends up happening is that each player has an incentive to cheat. Right? Each player would be better off by deviating from this scenario. Player A could deviate and instead of getting five years in prison, could get zero years in prison. Player B could deviate and again go from five to zero years. So both of them, although they both agreed to start here, it's not a stable solution because either player would be better off to deviate, better off to deviate and obtain this snitch outcome. As they do so, well, they end up finally at our Nash equilibrium and this thus is our stable outcome. And again, why is it a stable outcome? Well, if we start here, player B's option is to stay silent, which is worse off. So no, 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 they're not going to move from snitching to being silent. They're, it's in their best interest to stay snitching. Player A, well, they could move from snitching to silent. And again, they'd be worse off. So they have no incentive to leave this box once they're here. So this is our stable, our stable outcome with no incentive to move. So as a result, we stay at our Nash equilibrium, our stable outcome. Let's expand upon this. Let's take a look at this from a firm perspective. Let's take a look at it. We can expand this out to be more than just a two by two matrix. We could play this with a whatever by whatever matrix, but just to show that we could have it bigger, let's use a three by three. So let's jump ahead and take a look at that. So let's take a look at another game. And in this case here, we have both Honda. Uh, we'll go both Honda and Toyota. And they are two oligopolists competing with each other. And we'll suppose that they're competing with each other over output, right? That was what we said they were competing over. And in this case here, they're trying to figure out what factory size to build. If they build a large factory, well, they get to build, they get to produce lots of stuff. If they build a small factory, well, then they'll produce just a few things. So they're determining, okay, do I go large factory? Do I go small factory? If I go large factory, I get to produce a lot, but I also face a lot higher costs. So let's fill out this game matrix. We'll say that we have three options altogether. We have for each of these guys, we have small. We could either build a small plant, a medium plant, or a large plant, right? And by plant, I mean factory, like production plant, production facility. Toyota, very similarly, they have their choice to go small. They have their choice to go medium or they could go large. So let's fill in this diagram, let's put in our payoffs, and we'll go from there. Okay, so here we have Honda, we have Toyota, we have our three different plants, and we have our payoffs being reported as profit in millions. Keeping in mind, right, these firms, they wanna maximize their profit. That's our fundamental assumption of producer theory, that firms exist to maximize their profit. So a bit of a bigger game here, also, you'll notice where our last game was symmetric, this game is not, right? And what I mean by symmetric, let's go jump back and take a look. Negative 5, negative 5, 10, 0, 0, 10, right? These two were just mirrors of each other. We had symmetry as we went through. Not the case here, right? These guys don't really, they're not the same, just reversed. These guys are, again, not the same, reversed. So we have completely a unique game. What we want to do is we want to work through this. We want to figure out what are our best responses 
Are there, is there a Nash equilibrium, equilibria? And if so, what is it? Where do we end up at? So let's go take a look. To begin, again, just preference. You can start with any player. I tend to like to start with my row player. And so to keep in mind how I do that. For my row player, I fix my column player strategy. So I say, okay, as Toyota, I say, okay, for sure Honda is going to go small. If for sure Honda is going to go small, well, what are my options? I could get 100, 110, or 112. Oh, well, between those guys, 112 seems like the best to me. So, okay, I'm, I'm going to go large. If Honda goes small, I go large. Then we move forward. What if Honda goes medium? Well, if Honda goes medium, I can have 80, 95, or 94. Okay, between these three, 95 seems to be the best payoff. So if Honda goes medium, I'll go medium. Finally, what do we do if Honda goes large? So we fix Honda's strategy. We say, okay, for sure Honda goes large. I have the option between these payoffs, 70, 75, or 91. Well, in this case here, 91 is my best payoff, my best response, right? So keep in mind what I've done in each case is I've said, okay, I'm fixing Honda's strategy. Honda is going to do this. If they do, what is my best response to that? And picking out my best course of action. And then carry on. Well, what if they did this instead? What if they did this instead? On and on and on for all of Honda's possible choices. Okay, what we notice too that's different in this case is that Toyota doesn't always do the same thing. In our previous case here, player B, player A, they had dominant strategies of always snitching. Irrespective of what the other player did, they were always best off to snitch. We see this isn't the case, right? Toyota, they are not best off always going large. We have this case where they're better off to go medium. What we can look at, though, is we can say, hey, Toyota never has a case where they'll go small, right? So that, that's kind of overruled. What we then do is we then switch it around. We now know what Toyota's best responses are. We now want to figure out what Honda's best responses are. So we do the same thing. We fix Toyota strategies. We say, okay, for sure, for sure Toyota is going to go small. If for sure Toyota goes small, what do we do? Well, we could get 100, 105, or 102. Between these, what's my best payoff? What's my profit maximization? Well, 105 will be my best scenario in that case. What about if Toyota goes medium? Well, if Toyota goes medium, I'm looking at 89, 92, or 80. Well, between these guys, 92 is my best payoff. So if Toyota goes medium, I'll go medium. Finally, what's my best scenario if Toyota goes large? Well, if Toyota goes large, I could be getting 80, 90, or 94. So, okay, in this case here, if Toyota goes large, I should go large. What we then do to wrap up is we find our overlapping strategies. We find where our best responses overlap with each other, and these overlapping strategies, these are our Nash equilibrium. So we have one Nash equilibrium here, where we both go medium. And then we have another Nash equilibrium here, where we both go large. Now, which one do we end up at? Well, without some additional kind of thought into this, without some additional kind of theory, which we're not really going to be taking a look at here in 103, we're not really going to be sure. Right, and really this depends on kind of who moves first. We can have kind of a first mover kind of situation. If Toyota moved first and chose large, well then Honda's gonna get stuck into large. If Toyota moved first and chose medium, well then very similarly, Honda would be stuck in medium. And we see that, hey, whoever moves first is gonna kind of choose accordingly. If Toyota can move first, well, they're kind of choosing ultimately between 95 or 91. Toyota would choose to go medium. However, if Honda got to choose first, they're looking between 92 or 94. So if Honda gets to move first, Honda is going to be choosing large. So 
first mover, that's going to end up influencing things. If they both move simultaneously, well, then we're going to have to kind of figure out, are they trying to maximize their maximum? Are they trying to minimize their loss? What are they doing in this case? A whole bunch of extra stuff to look at beyond the scope of this course. Don't get caught up in that, right? If you're interested, game theory is an interesting topic. Feel free to take a look at it. Feel free to dive in farther. But for this purpose here, all we would be able to say, all we're going to be able to identify is that we have two Nash equilibrium at medium, medium, and large, large. That is really our outcome in this case here. Two potential Nash equilibrium. Okay. Let's go back. Let's go take a look at, again, Telus and Shaw. And let's talk about, again, kind of where this would work out. And we'll take a look at one more game. And really, this is just to show us quite a few bits of how we would do this, really get the experience in solving these game matrices. So let's take a look at another game. Okay, so here we have both Shaw and Telus. We're looking at their profit in millions for our payoffs. And they are determining, okay, what do we do for our mobile plans? Do we just continue to offer the status quo of some fixed amount of data? And as soon as you hit that, you have the charge for data overages. Or do we move to, kind of hard to see given my chicken scratch writing here, do we move to unlimited data, right? So our two options, stay it is as it is, cap our data, have charges for data overages, or move to unlimited data plans. And we see that because, hey, Sean, tell us split the market, whatever one does influences the other. If TELUS decides to go unlimited data, they're going to steal a bunch of Shaw's customers. By stealing that, TELUS is going to get a bunch of profit. So, okay, they kind of have an incentive to go that way. Shaw, very similarly, if Shaw chooses one thing, it will influence what TELUS does on and on and on, right? Hence the nature of games of strategy, hence the nature of our game theory. So let's take a look. Let's play through this. And what you'll notice is that our payoffs are a little bit different. In our previous cases, I had these color-coded, right? That was purely just to kind of get us started to help us out. Now in this scenario here, this is typically how our game matrices are provided to us. They're not color-coded. They're not going through in this kind of way. We just have to go through and we have to identify that our first set of payoffs are for the row player. Our second set of payoffs are for the column player. So sometimes I see, right, to help kind of students out with this, I'll notice that they kind of do one of these. They'll kind of just underline the first guy with one color, and then they'll underline the second guy with another color. Just to be able to say, hey, these guys are for Shaw, the first ones, those ones are for Telus. So if you need a trick like that in order to kind of help keep these constant, great. Feel free to use these kind of little tips and tricks. If it helps you get the right answer, that's the way to go about it. What we ultimately want to do, though, is we want to find out, is there a Nash equilibrium, right? If there is, where is it? Is it unique, or do we have more than one? So let's take a look at this case here. And again, just out of nature, I tend to start this game off by looking at the row player. So I'm going to start off by taking a look at Telus. And the way that this works, of course, is we fix one of Shaw's strategies. We say, okay, for sure, Shaw is going to go status quo. If Shaw stays status quo, what does Telus do? They can either get 10 or they can get 12. Well, if Shaw stays status quo, 12 sounds better than 10. I'm wanting to maximize my profit. So if Shaw stays status quo, Telus is going to go unlimited data. What if Shaw goes unlimited data? Well, if Shaw goes unlimited data, we're looking at four to five. So, okay, between these two, five, that's kind of my better outcome there. So that's what I'd prefer to do. Okay, we have TELUS's best responses. We see that in each case, TELUS, they have the incentive to go unlimited data. They have a dominant strategy in this case. Irrespective of what Shaw ends up choosing, TELUS will always choose unlimited data. Great. What about going the other way? What if we're Shaw? Well, if we're Shaw, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to fix TELUS' strategies. We're going to say, okay, TELUS is going to go, oh, let's change our colors. We're going to say TELUS is going to go status quo. If TELUS for sure goes status quo, well, I'm looking at either 10 or 15. Yeah, we'll take 15. 
What if TELUS goes unlimited? Well, if TELUS goes unlimited, we're looking at three or four. So, okay, yeah, between these two, we'll take four. Again, we see that Shaw also has a dominant strategy. Shaw similarly has a dominant strategy to always go unlimited data. And we get the overlap of our two best responses, yielding for us our dominant strategy. And thus, sorry, they had dominant strategies. The overlapping best responses yields for us our Nash equilibrium, such that it's again our stable equilibrium. Once we find ourselves here, we're happy, we're stuck, we're not moving. So again, another game, another way to work through it. Very similar to our prisoner's dilemma that we started off with, but in this case, not symmetric. We had very different payoffs as we went through, and we get our private Nash equilibrium at unlimited, unlimited. Let's compare and contrast this, right? Let's work out what our social optimal is. That is between TELUS and Shaw, where would they want to be? Where is their best outcome if they could convince each other to work as a team? and not compete with one another. Well, if they could convince each other to work as a team, they could split the profit as needed between these boxes here. And so what would we have? We would have 20 here, 10 and 10. 12 and three would give me 15, 19, and five and four, that's only nine. So what we see is that, hey, by competing with each other, by each of them trying to act in their own best interest, we get a private optimal, but that's the lowest joint profit between the two of them. In fact, the highest level of profit for the two of them to be able to split would be right here where they both decide to stay status quo, status quo, right? They could both share $20 million in profit. That is by competing with each other, they drive their profit down towards nine. The more fiercely the competition, the more fiercely they'll compete, the more fiercely they'll push down their profit, potentially down towards zero, right? Depending on the degree of competition that they may have. So kind of our thing with our oligopolies. Okay, so we've taken a look at our game matrices. We've figured out how to identify our social optimal, the point with the highest social payoff. We've figured out how to identify our private optimal, that is our Nash equilibrium. And from here, really, this is what we're getting at with game theory. This is really what we're getting at with our oligopolists, that they're going to be choosing their level of output based off of this kind of metric. Well, what we'll do for the rest of this video, this ends us really for examinable content, but uh, it seems kind of like we just left a bunch of stuff. We never really got to take a look at our oligopolist. We never really got to figure out what their optimal level of Q star was. We didn't get to talk a lot about the theory of an oligopolist, why they exist, why we allow them to exist, and the like. And then we also didn't take a look at a few other types of games. So for the remainder of this video, what I want to take a look at is I want to take a look at some theory of oligopolies. Right? And this, this guy here, this theory of oligopolies to start off, this bit, this bit will be important. That is to say important, it's all important, all to say this is examinable. <laughs> That's probably the best way to say that it's important, right? From here, though, after we go through this theory of oligopolies, so hey, why this market structure exists, why we allow it to exist, it creates inefficiencies because it has market power, but hey, it's still important. We'll move on from here to take a look at other games. So we'll take a look at other games. We took a look at these case here, which is just one period games. So hey, TELUS makes their decision, Shaw makes their decision, they make these decisions simultaneously, and then they get their payoff and that's the end, right? There's no subsequent um, punishment, reward, anything like that based off of what they've done. So we'll take a look at some other games that are maybe sequential move games, like hey, Telus gets to move first, and then Shaw gets to react to Telus' choice, and we'll go from there. Attached to these other games is what we're going to call a Corneau duopoly, such that this Corneau duopoly, really, we're going to be getting at our actual cost curves, 
marginal revenue, average revenue, average total cost, marginal cost. We're going to identify Q star, and we're going to see how these two firms go through competing in this kind of structure to obtain a Nash equilibrium and a Nash equilibrium level of output. So we'll take a look at these two. These are entirely just for additional interest. If you're interested, you can always take a look at other courses in game theory. There are courses specifically dedicated to this topic. Big area of interest for sure for many students. But to start off, let's take a look at this theory of our oligopolies. So in our oligopoly, let's take a look at our market structure. So in our market structure, an oligopoly was defined as a few large firms, right? So these few large firms having exceptional market power, being able to go through and being able, being able to influence that market power just like a monopolist. A big difference, okay, these few large firms, well, because they're so large, one outcome influences the other firm. If I choose to do this, it influences that guy, right? That was the whole nature of our game theory. So that is, we needed to act strategically, strategically, right? So we had to use game theory. We had to use this kind of construct in order to figure out what our best responses are in order to be profit maximizing. We saw that in our market structure, for an oligopolist, they may or may not have differentiated goods. And this really just depends on the market on whole. Sometimes we'll witness differentiated goods between oligopolies. Other times this differentiation is really slight, if at all, right? So some examples of oligopolies here in Canada, we have our banking. Something about like 92% of all assets are owned by the big six. So the big six banks in Canada, Royal Bank, CIBC, TD, Bank of Montreal, Bank of Nova Scotia, National Bank, these big six really account for the entire market. All of our credit unions, case de populaires, trusts, etc., they really only account for 8% of market share. So it's pretty easy to say that banking in Canada is an oligopolistic market. Right, six large firms really influence altogether, meaning that these banks, when they're choosing what to set for their interest rates, when they're choosing what to do for their promotions, etc., all of that to try to get more assets, all of that to try to get more deposits, really all of that comes back to our game theory. These banks act strategically. What should I do given what CIBC does? CIBC very similarly is saying, what should I do given what TD, RBC, etc. all does? So games of strategy being played in here. And right, banking, uh, some might argue that that's a differentiated good, right? Different banks offer slightly different versions. What do they really focus on customer service? Do they focus on investment? What's, what's their focus, right? So yeah, yeah, there might be slight differentiation there, but Many, many Canadians view banking rather homogenous. They don't see a ton of difference, a ton of difference between them for, for most people at least. I, I take the argument they're slight, of course. We also have, as we took a look, we have our telecommunication. So telecommunication is, again, a situation where we only really have our four big players and really the fourth one just entered. We had historically Rogers, TELUS, and Bell. We just had the entrant of Shaw. Still, yes, more entrance means more competition, but still very much an oligopolistic marketplace. Only a few big firms operating. And again, telecommunication services, they all offer slightly different, but again, end of the day, all they're doing is they're offering a plan for you to be able to utilize your phone. There's really not much differentiation between these goods. So slight, if any, differentiation in that telecom market. Many, many others, but last one we'll list. Here in Canada, we have air travel. Right? Here in Canada, really all we have is Air Canada and WestJet. There are a few really small local providers, but... Really, in a nutshell, again, WestJet, Air Canada, they dominate the air travel market. 
and as such they have an oligopoly over this case. So, and again, is there really much difference between Air Canada and WestJet? Some people say there's a huge difference coming down to customer service, coming down to how they're treated. So arguably, yeah, both firms have done really well to kind of define their brand, differentiate their brand. But again, that degree of differentiation kind of depends on the consumer, depends on the consumer. Final form of market structure, not form, but determinative market structure is our barriers. Right. And in this case here, we say that oligopolies, they do have barriers to enter and exit. And this is really why the oligopolies exist and why we don't have new entrants coming in, why we don't have more competing in air travel, telecom and banking. It's because of these barriers that are put up and these barriers. Well, these are the exact same barriers as we talked about when we looked at our monopoly. We have both natural as well as created and these created can be again either legal barriers or other created barriers by the firm itself let's talk about these natural barriers because just like a monopolist these oligopolists the majority of these that actually continue to operate as oligopolists the reason why is typically because of natural barriers Right, We do have cases where legal barriers have created this, have allowed this to be, but in these cases here, it is really a combination of both natural and legal. Banking. Banking is, here in Canada, predominantly a legal barrier. Right, Underneath the Canadian Banking Act, we really want to limit our number of firms. We really want to limit the amount of competition in order to ensure that we have strong, safe banks, that we don't have these bank failures occurring. So we've created a legal barrier to really restrict how many banks can exist. As a result, we've created an oligopoly banking market. Telecommunication. This is partly legal. This is largely, though, natural. And that is there's a huge upfront capital cost to provide telecommunication wireless services across the whole country of Canada. That being said, Canada is very sparsely populated, right? We have only a handful of people and they're spread out over a massive country. So the amount of upfront capital you would need in order to connect everybody in the country is massive. And as a result, satisfying the entire demand for telecommunication services within Canada, well, only a few firms can do that and operate at their minimum efficient scale. If we began to have more and more and more firms enter, well, as these more firms enter, they'd have to build their own cell phone towers, etc., etc., etc. As they did so, they'd have huge capital costs. They'd be splitting the market. And as they split the market, no one can get to their minimum efficient scale. They all have higher costs, a more difficult time actually being profitable in this case, just like our natural barriers for a monopoly. In this case, we can just hit that minimum efficient scale, not just with one firm, but with a few firms. So our natural barriers. Air travel. Air travel, again, is partly legal and partly natural. And in this case here, it's because these legal barriers kind of create a natural barrier. We have a lot of regulations put into place as to what must be done before you can launch air travel. And these just increase the cost of doing so. Again, very similar to telecom, large country, sparsely populated, very expensive to fly this big airplane all the way across just to fly a few people. So... In that case here, the demand's relatively low. Only a few firms can satisfy that demand at their minimum, at or near their minimum efficient scale. So barriers clearly exist in this case for really our big three oligopoly kind of markets here in Canada. Again, what does this mean? What do these barriers represent? Well, barriers represent that it is possible to earn long run profit. Right. And we see that in all of these industries, all of these industries are able to hold on to long run economic profit. And it's the barriers that prevent entry from getting in there. Of course, just like when we talked about our monopolist with our very long run, we would expect to witness creative destruction. 
and circumvention of barriers. And these two together, creative destruction and circumvention of barriers, in the very long run, will tend to move an oligopolist towards monopolistic competition and thus begin to drive our profit towards zero. Right? So as we transition to the very, very long run, monopolies move towards oligopolies. Oligopolies move towards monopolistic competition. As we have more and more and more monopolistic competition, there becomes less and less and less differentiation between goods, and our monopolistically competitive firms move towards perfect competition. This really is getting all back to our formal defense of free markets, which says, hey, if we just left things alone for long enough, every market would be efficient eventually. Right, And it's because eventually these market forces would work themselves out, would drive everything over a long enough time period towards this perfect competition, and everything would be efficient without us messing it up. Well, okay. We see that, yes, the theory kind of makes sense, but how long is that very long run for this to happen? Right, That could be generations. That could be too long. And in the meantime, while that's happening, industries are outright destroyed. New monopolies show up. New oligopolies show up. Right. So regulation, government intervention in order to overcome this can be important. So, OK, government intervention. Our oligopolies, they have market power. Right. So just like with our monopolies, just like with our monopolistic, uh, monopolist, monopolistic competition, we have a situation where if we were to take a look at a single a single duopolist or a single oligopolist, we would have price quantity. We would have our demand curve and then twice as steep would be our marginal revenue. So there's demand average revenue price. This would be my marginal revenue. We would have a market supply or really the firm's marginal cost curve. And what we see is that again, profit maximizing sets marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. So right there, we would get our value of Q star, our profit maximizing level of output. We would take that, we would drag it up and we would get our corresponding price that we charge. What we witness is that at this Q star, well, we have a marginal benefit from our demand curve up here. We have a marginal cost down there. We have a case where marginal benefit does not equal marginal cost. That is price does not equal marginal cost. Therefore, we are not allocatively efficient. That is, if we are not allocatively efficient, well, not allocatively efficient, we have a market failure. So this market, anytime we have an oligopoly, we have a market failure. So, okay, if this is the case, why do we allow these oligopolists to continue? Why do we allow them to continue despite this market failure? Why don't we crush telecom, crush air travel, crush our banking system and drive them to be more efficient? Well, few big reasons. First big reason is that oligopolists are highly competitive. Right? Or rather, they have high competitive behavior, right? They really compete with each other. And this high level of competition between different oligopolists, it can drive profit, uh, we'll go towards zero, right? So approximately zero. Now, keep in mind, oligopolists often will earn handsome, positive economic profit. But if there is high levels of competition, they will drive it towards zero. So it won't be zero. Well, it could be, but unlikely to be. Usually it's positive, but the competition will drive it towards zero, meaning that ah, they're really not getting this extra bit. Second, given their command of massive amounts of resources by being one of only few firms in this, and given this high levels of competition, they have a huge incentive 
a huge incentive to invest in research and development, right? So they have huge competitive behavior. They have massive command of resources. They get to use both of these to invest in research and development. That is new technologies. And so through these new technologies, like we saw earlier, technology is the biggest driving force, a biggest contributor to our rising standard of living, quality of life, and oligopolies are a driving force of that. So yes, they create a market failure. Yes, they're inefficient, but if they're highly competitive, well, we get a lot of cool new technologies which are helpful to society from this. So it's a big trade-off to be had there, right? Another big one, Again, if they're highly competitive, and this is really the big part, when we end up looking at our regulation for oligopolies, it's not necessarily to destroy them, it's to ensure that they are competitive, that they are acting competitively and that they're not colluding with each other. If they're acting competitively, we tend to be okay with them because they create technologies and through their competition, they tend to increase quality of goods and increase our level of service. Because they're competing, because they're close competitors with one another, hey, this close competition, if you're not happy with the service of Shaw, you jump to TELUS. If you're not happy with the service of TELUS, you jump to Rogers. They're all very, very similar. They're close substitutes. So in this case here, they have an incentive to increase their customer service. They have an incentive to increase the quality of the good or service they provide. In this case here, high competition drives kind of those better products, better services, new technologies, all of which is beneficial on whole to society. So yes, oligopolies, oligopolistic markets are a market failure. They are not allocatively efficient. Our focus on these though is not to increase efficiency, is not to push them towards efficiency, Rather, our focus for oligopolies tends to be tends to be to ensure that they are competitive, to ensure that they're not colluding and sharing monopoly level profits, but that they're actually competing and out trying to outdo each other. And if that's the case, we witness technological growth, we witness a growth in quality and service. So kind of our rationale as to why we allow oligopolies to continue. Very similar, right? We had the case with monopolistic competition. They also cause market failures. We tended to allow them to continue as well because they provided variety. Yes, there was a cost to variety, but we said, well, we kind of like that we don't all look the same, so we're going to take that variety despite the, despite the loss of efficiency. It's a trade-off, right? Everything in life is a trade-off. That's the whole basis of economics. And both for monopolistic competition and for oligopolists, we have said, Okay, there's a market failure, you're not allocatively efficient, but as long as these conditions are met, we value this kind of spin-off, so we value this spillover, and because of this spillover, as long as you're being competitive, as long as you're trying to outdo each other, we'll allow you to continue, we'll allow the inefficiency to continue. So that's the idea behind our oligopolies. Let's go on next and let's take a look at a few other games. Uh, the game I want to take a look at next is, first of all, our Corno Duopoly. So for Corno Duopoly, the story goes something like this. And we can pretend again just because, hey, it's the example we've been using for a while. Let's suppose we're talking about the market for telecommunications. So we'll talk about the market for telecom. And for simplicity, all we're talking about is a duopoly here. And again, we'll suppose our duopoly is TELUS and Shaw. What we'll presume to start off is that we have a market demand for telecommunication. And really this market demand is just market demand for telecommunication. We are as consumers relatively indifferent between whether this is satisfied by TELUS or whether it's satisfied by Shaw. It's just, hey, Telecommunication services are telecommunication. Uh, it's just who's connecting my phone. I don't really care who it is. And so we have a downward sloping demand curve. 
we'll presume we have our upward sloping marginal cost. And then very similarly, because they have market power, here's my demand, twice as steep though, that guy there, that's my marginal revenue. Okay, let's suppose that TELUS, TELUS is the first one to the stage. And they're kind of looking at this and they're hoping, hey, maybe, just maybe, if I act first, if TELUS gets to go first, they can just choose their level of output saying, hey, this is the market demand, this is the market, the industry marginal cost. Maybe I can just choose to act right here. We'll call that Q star TELUS, which is as a monopolist would act. And hey, because I'm acting as a monopolist, maybe I'll satisfy the market altogether. And by satisfying this market altogether, there's no room for Shaw to enter, right? I've essentially just formed my monopoly, my little TELUS monopoly, and there's no room for Shaw. Okay, so we'll say that that's TELUS's plan. They set up as such, and then boom, we have our quantity exchanged, Q star TELUS, and the corresponding price which they charge. Keep in mind where that came from, we just equated the marginal revenue with the marginal cost. Okay, but keep in mind that TELUS, if we take a look at our full demand for telecommunication services, TELUS is only satisfying this demand for telecommunication. Right? They're only satisfying the people who had a willingness to pay of price TELUS and higher. That is, there is still all of this demand here that is being unsatisfied. Right, It's not being satisfied by any provider. These guys, they'd like telecommunication services, but not at that high price. So what we can pretend, what we can take a look at, we'll switch colors here, we'll go to yellow, that this bit here, there's a residual demand for telecommunication. All of this blue shaded bit is our residual demand. And what we can do is we can kind of say, okay, there's my residual demand. And kind of keep in mind that that residual demand, you can kind of look at it as such. We just moved it to the left and said, hey, that's really, this is now the demand that's left over for Shaw. Shaw gets to look at things and say, okay, well, TELUS has dominated this part of the demand curve. What I have available is first unit is first unit. This is the residual demand which Shaw ends up witnessing. And A, as they have market power, they witness this downward sloping demand curve. They get a marginal revenue curve twice as steep. And so they go and they take a look at that and they say, okay, Right here, that's my marginal revenue equals my marginal cost. So, boom, there is my Q star for Shaw. And at that Q star, I'm going to go up to that residual demand, that leftover demand, and I'm going to charge my price. And we see that Shaw charges this new lower price based off of that residual demand, that leftover demand that was not being satisfied by TELUS. But, okay, now we have this scenario. We have this case where TELUS acted as if they were a monopoly, right? They were hoping that Shaw was going to produce nothing. But Shaw did produce. Shaw did produce, meaning that TELUS actually overextended themselves. They produced too much with relation to this market. That is, between TELUS and Shaw, they flooded this market with output. So now because Shaw did act, TELUS is no longer having a best response. So TELUS now needs to change what they're doing. They need to update their production mix, and they'll take a look at, okay, what's our residual demand left over again? Update, move forward. Shaw then reacts, updates, moves forward, on and on and on, and this diagram will get hideous very fast. So what we want to do is we want to kind of take a look at this from a different perspective. And the way that we can take a look at this from a different perspective is really going back to our game theory. And going back to our game theory, what we can take a look at is, in this sense here, we could take a look at our Q star for Shaw. We can take a look at our Q star 
or tell us. And that is what we're looking at is really saying, just like we had up here, there's my Q star, there's my Q star. We're recognizing that, hey, they're going to change. This is what TELUS did underneath the assumption that Shaw did nothing, right? TELUS acted as a monopolist, presuming Shaw was going to produce zero. Shaw's best response to TELUS was to produce Q star Shaw. Well, TELUS was producing this underneath the assumption that this was the best response to zero. Shaw didn't do zero. TELUS needs to update. TELUS will get a new Q star. On and on and on and on. So what we'll end up getting, we would have TELUS's best response looking as such. Right, we'll write this in. This is TELUS's best response function. And then very similarly, we would have a line looking something like this being Shaw's best response. So we'll go Shaw's best response function. And story goes kind of just like how we already talked about it. We'll presume that TELUS moves first, and we'll presume that, hey, TELUS, they think they can act as a monopoly. They're saying, what is our best response if Shaw produces zero? Well, at Q star Shaw of zero, best response for TELUS is right here. So we get Q star TELUS. Well, okay. Shaw now witnesses this Q star TELUS, and Shaw responds by saying, okay, TELUS produces there. My best response to that is going to be right here. Carry that down. And we get our Q star for Shaw. What we witness, though, is that, hey, Shaw did not produce zero. Shaw produced Q star Shaw, meaning that this is not actually TELUS's best response. This was TELUS's best response given Q Shaw was zero, but Q Shaw is not zero. It's over here. So what does TELUS do? Well, TELUS goes and says, okay, if this is what Shaw is producing, this is my new best response. So TELUS updates their Q star. As TELUS updates their Q star, so does Shaw. All right, this continues, this continues. They go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until we find overlapping best responses, just like we did when we were dealing with our tables. And we have overlapping best responses right where these two lines cross each other. And that is right here. This is our Nash equilibrium. That would be the level at which we produce. This would be our Q star for each one. That would be my Q star for Shaw and my Q star for TELUS, such that, hey, my best response to TELUS is this level being produced by Shaw. TELUS's best response to Shaw is one and the same, right? We're equal. We have no incentive to move anymore. This is our competitive, our Nash equilibrium. This is where our oligopolist would end up, given this Cournot duopoly. What we can look at is we can look at another extreme as well, though. We could take a look at a situation if we connect these inside lines. And keep in mind that what this here was to start off, we said this is how much TELUS produced underneath the assumption that Shaw produced zero. That is, this was a monopoly level of output. Very similarly, on the other extreme, this guy right here, this would be what Shaw would produce if they assumed that TELUS was producing zero. So again, this would be a monopoly level of output. What we then get is that any point along this inside white line is going to be a collusion line, such that if we ended up anywhere along this white line, this would be a level of output such that Shaw and TELUS willfully hold their level of production low in order to share monopoly profits. As we move this way, as we move out from that line, so even including our Nash equilibrium, that is more output than the monopoly level, 
more output than the monopoly level means lower prices, meaning lower profits. So as they compete, they're competing over quantity, increasing their output, dropping their prices, dropping their profits. So competition will allow that to happen. Ideally, right, from a social perspective, in order to increase our social welfare, we don't want this collusion line. We don't want them to collude with each other. We want them to compete. And the more they compete, the lower the prices, the more that's being produced. We won't get all the way to perfect competition, right? We won't get to an efficient place, but we'll get better than a monopoly level place. So our idea behind a Corno duopoly. Just kind of a way to overview this or to see this from that kind of way, right? As I said, these other games, this is just kind of more for a your interest scenario, not necessarily an examinable content. Next, let's take a look at really where our game theory came from. And this last example we're going to look at is going to be a sequential game. And these sequential games, really where these come from is the basis of game theory, which really came from the Cold War. Right? It was a way that in warfare was developed during the Cold War to say, okay, we're the US, they're Russia, we're both rational, we both want the continuation of the human species. What should I do given what you're going to do? And you're going to do given what I'm going to do, and let's work through things in this kind of way, right? And it was a way to kind of work out what your opponent might do and what your best response would be. So let's take a look at a classic sequential game in this kind of way here and see how we work it out. So let's take a look. So in our sequential games like this, in this case, we have a game of chicken, right? So you would imagine, right, your classic ridiculous game of chicken. You have two cars driving right at each other in the same lane. You have both vehicles, vehicle one, vehicle two, player one, player two, and they have two options. They can either go straight or they can be the chicken and they can swerve. What we have is player one, right? They get to choose first. Are they going to swerve or are they going to go straight? And then player two gets to make up their mind. Are they going to swerve or are they going to go straight? What we see in these sequential games is that the second player gets to really choose the final outcome. And so what we have to start off with this is we want to start at the end and work our way back as to what player one should do. So the way to identify this is to start off as player two and identify for each of player one situations what their best response would be. So that is, let's suppose that we know player one is going to swerve. If player one is going to swerve, should I swerve and get three? Or should I go straight and get four? Well, again, I want to maximize my payoffs. So in this case here, four would be my choice, right? So player two would go straight if player one swerves. Very similarly, player one, if they go straight, player two wants to then figure out, okay, what's my, again, my optimal choice? What's my best response if player one goes straight? Well, in this case here, they could swerve for two or they could stay straight for one. So in this case here, my best response would be to swerve. Okay, so what we figured out based off of this, based off of player two's best responses, we know that we would end up at one out of these two outcomes, right? This is where we're going to be. Player one can now choose the outcome, which way they want to go, in order to obtain the best possible outcome for them. Player one's options are either swerve and end up at a two, or to go straight and up, end up at a four. Now that we've isolated player two's responses, player one can now act, and player one can determine that their best course of action would be to go straight, knowing that player two would then swerve, giving us this payoff. Thus, our Nash equilibrium. So we'd always start off in this case here by starting off at our last case, right? In this case here, the second actor. From that second actor, we would figure out what their optimal choices are. Player one then gets to work back and can then choose the outcome that they ultimately want, knowing how player two is going to react. And so in our sequential action games, 
we get this kind of scenario where it seems like really the ball is in player two's court. They get to kind of limit the outcomes, but ultimately it's player one that gets to choose that final, that final outcome in the end. So a brief example of our sequential games. You can, of course, take a look at a lot more examples of this. There's many, many versions out there. Just a quick look. You can quickly Google game theory, and you'll come across a treasure trove of great information, great additional courses and the like, getting into the basis of game theory. This here, as I said, just serves as that basic introduction to the concept and really that basic kind of way in which we utilize it in order to explain firm behavior. Firm behavior specifically for oligopolists, that is when my choices impact you and in thus our choice as to what we're going to produce, what our optimal Q star is. So that does us for our talk about game theory. That does us for our talk about oligopolists. If you have any questions about any of this, please feel free to reach out to me either through our D12 frequently asked questions or feel free to shoot me an email. Thanks.